Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another You Be the Behavior Consultant. Do I hear myself? Oh, I think I do. I'm just awfully quiet. Let me try that again. Yep, there I am. Okay, I just have it down way down low. You can tell I'm a little congested here, get, getting over something. Um, yeah, so uh, welcome back. We are revisiting a topic that apparently is quite popular, which I'm, I'm glad. It's a great topic. We're, we're kind of looking at can you see the four quadrants, what we call a nonlinear contingency analysis. And when I look at the number of replays on last week's, or well, I guess it was the week before actually, because we did a, a global online animal training series presentation with Jim Mackey from the Zool. Society of London last week. So this was the week before. I see we had quite a few people watch the replay of the one we did the week before. So we are revisiting this topic. We'll get into it a little deeper. Uh, and for those of you that didn't get to join us last time, um, oh great, thank you Annetta for letting me know that you can hear me. Um, yeah, for some reason my uh, earphones were, had, were, I guess I had them down low or something. Who knows, whatever, but we're here, so that, that's the good news. So if you're new to us, just joining us for the first time, this is You Be the Behavior Consultant, the live stream I try to do almost every Monday. We've got um, uh, coming up on a hundred of these uh, that we've done since uh, I started doing these. And how does it work? I present a topic for discussion. Um, we try to be interactive here. We want you to participate. I ask questions about the topic. We look at video. We're going to definitely look at video this week. And then we recap it all at the end. And we try to keep it to an hour. And we're definitely going to keep it to an hour this week. So what are we looking at this week? We are looking at basically can you see the learning processes can you see the four quadrants and this is our part two of this discussion so if you didn't catch the first one um, you might want to go back and watch this the first one but we're not going to make it so that you have to watch the first one to participate in this one we'll make it so that it's just sort of a continuing discussion here and um, and so what this is is really called is sort of a nonlinear contingency analysis and what does that look like and how this type of analysis can help your training and so I'm I'm kind of curious any of you that participated in the first week or watched the replay I'm kind of wondering if you know how that uh, um, impacted your training any of you that watched that that replay or participated in that have any of you been practicing <laughs> has has anyone been looking at your training a little bit differently has it impacted you a little bit um, maybe did you learn something I know um, some of us participated in the tower talks which is a um, just kind of a Zoom get together that that members of Animal Training Fundamentals um, dot com can participate in, and we actually had some really fun discussions about the donkey training video, and um, so we are going to revisit that video in this particular live stream today, and then we'll look at some more videos too because there were some additional questions people had about that one, and um, so I was hoping we would touch base on that. Um, uh, again uh, as well I don't know so I don't know if anyone uh, everyone's being a little bit quiet today that's all right you know sometimes it takes time to get people started here that's why I have my questions here to prompt people um, to, to get in, into it a little bit um, so I don't know if people uh, remember that video but it involved a donkey that well and I can show the video to get people talking you know if we just want to get into it um, well, and maybe I should do a little a little recap, um, just to just to get us into it. So, so you guys may remember the linear analysis, the linear contingency analysis is our ABCs, right? So, um, so with the three term contingency, that's the you know you're looking at the antecedents, the behavior, and the consequences. So, you know what are the conditions under which the behavior occurs, um, a detailed description of the behavior, and what are the consequences that maintain that behavior. And then if you're looking at the four-term contingency, you're also looking at the motivating operations. So what are the conditions that may increase the um, effectiveness of the consequence? But when we look at the nonlinear contingency analysis, and so I've got some pictures here that may relate. Oh, Gus is here with us today. Yay. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, Gus. Um, when we were looking at that nonlinear contingency analysis, and this was the definition that came from that really awesome book that I know some people have picked up that's by uh, written. Let me see if I still have, do I still have that picture here? I'm going to go back and see if I've got the, the picture. 
can see is it here oh nope that's a different different resources oh i might have uh did i take out that resource i might have taken out the the picture of the resource on the books um but it's a uh, it's the book by Joe Lang and um, and Paul and uh, a Awab. Um, uh, that's the nonlinear contingency analysis. I, I even put the book back on my bookshelf, so I can't even just hold the book up for you. But uh, but yeah, so this is the definition taken straight out of that book with um, that talks about how one um, thing that you will look at is those ABCs that are directly related to that specific, um, so that, that target behavior. But then you may look at alternative sets or matrices of consequential contingencies of which the target behavior um, and, currently beha uh, and currently available alternative patterns are members of. And so this is really what we were really picking apart in our videos. So we were, we were looking at all the different contingencies that might be happening in the video. And then the C might be some things that you might have to explore a little bit more through some questioning. Um, you may be asking about things that, that you know, you may not be able to see right in that video. And that may take a little bit more investigation that we may not get just from looking at a video clip. Uh, but but that's that can get that book really goes into that a lot more. Oh, and Anna's here too. Uh, Anna and and Anna's uh, Anne's at saying thanks for um, explaining it a little bit more. And um, and so there's a lot more than just saying oh just what what can I reinforce you know as a target behavior goal or a behavior that I'm trying to reduce. There's all these different layers going on there. So if we go back to our donkey. And maybe we'll take a little look at that video again, because um, I think this would be fun to explore. Uh, let me go back to our video of that, and I may even... Um, there's that video, and I might take down the audio on this so I can talk over it. You guys remember this video now, some of you that were here last time? Do you guys re And you're welcome to type in the, in the chat. Do you guys remember some of the different things that we pointed out, the different contingencies that were going on. And I want to break this down a little bit more because in our tower talk, there were some things that came up, some questions that came up. And I'd love for you guys, if you still, if you have some questions to go ahead and throw them in the chat, because obviously we had them in the tower talk, but we didn't have them here. And so it'd be great for everyone to share their thoughts on that. So do you guys remember some of those contingencies? What were some of the things that you saw? If you did a nonlinear, or even in the linear, you know, you can do a linear analysis, but what are, what are some of the different contingencies that you see? Or remember from last time. <laughs> and I know it, uh, it takes a little bit for your, your typing to catch up with my talking. Okay, food for staying. So we had the, the contrived, and so this is another thing we didn't really talk about last time. So sort of, you know, the contrived reinforcers versus what might be sort of naturally occurring in the environment. So, so food is sort of a contrived reinforcer, right? So we are adding this food to the environment to reinforce that staying in position. And Gus noticed the negative reinforcement, which has to do with that uh, introducing the brush, right? So we're using um, a contrived reinforcer, so of food, to try and reinforce staying in position there. And food for staying with possible aversive stimulus present. And Anne's noticing that that brush had been the, that aversive stimulus, and I think Gus has noticed it's a negative reinforcement for um, introducing that brush. And I think one thing we didn't talk about is something else that may be going on with the brush. And I thought about this as I was preparing this yesterday, which I think is another thing that can happen with um, when, we think, when we think about constructional approaches to, um, to improving animal welfare. There's, there's a lot to think about with this video, and you know, it's so funny because when I first put it in here, I thought it was going to be an easy one, but it was really interesting as we started talking about it in the Tower Talk and, and also in the live stream last time. It, 
it actually generated a lot of discussion. So maybe it wasn't so straightforward. And, and one of the questions somebody had was about, you know, the, the rate that the food is coming. Because some people worry, um, it looks at times maybe the, the donkey wants to target the brush. I suppose it, that could happen if it gets reinforced. That's a good point. <clears throat> if reinforcement history gets built up for that. And maybe sometimes that does happen. You know, I, you know, I think, um, you know, you bring up an interesting point, Gus. I know for me, like when I work with parrots and say, like, I've trained a parrot to put its mouth onto a syringe to take oral medication. And now let's say I want to teach that parrot that I want to bring that syringe up to its chest for injection training, but it's got reinforcement history for touching the syringe with its mouth as a, and kind of like targeting, that does become a challenge. So that's a really good point. So it does depend on the reinforcement history. So I want to show you another video now just to get you thinking about, especially about the, the, um, the food coming towards the mouth and everything. So I'm just going to throw in this little mix here just to get you thinking a little bit. Look at so the now duration look at this on that. Video. <laughs> That's what we want Rolo to do. Still chewing and holding his nose or her nose at the... And what I like is she's not looking at your hands, you know? Yeah. She's really thinking about, I just need to focus on the target. I don't need to follow your hands for food. I don't need to go to your bucket for food. I just need to think about the target. Yeah. Kind of like what we did on the rugs, but now it's the station is the... Oh, so nice. That's great. Teach donkeys not to crowd people. Okay, what do you do? Yeah, nice. <laughs> go back. Stoffel was going back. There we go. Now she's gonna. Good. Look at little Henry. Oh, Henry knocked over his target. <laughs> Look at the duration on that. Let's try that. There we go. My volume was down for some reason. Okay, it's back. Thank you for giving me the heads up. <laughs> okay, I fixed it, I hope. Hopefully you can hear me now because I see little bars coming up. <laughs> okay, hopefully I'm back. Uh, okay, uh, everyone's telling me I'm muted, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing I'm back now because I see... Okay, good. All right, so... Um, so what I wanted to point out why, by bringing up that second video is that, and what also some of you have noticed, is that there's positive reinforcement for stationing behavior. And the reason I put the one with the target, the you know, having the donkey um, orient its nose towards the target, is when we 
train a stationing behavior, whether it's a nose orienting towards a target or hooves on a mat. Um, and in this case, we didn't have those additional props to help teach that stationing behavior. Basically, we just had a person delivering food, right? When we train that behavior, we often deliver food very fast at first, right? And then over time, we might um, put some delay in between delivery of reinforcers. And then we may make that delivery of the reinforcer a little bit more unpredictable so the animal never knows when that reinforcer might be delivered. And that way we start to get really nice long duration. That's how we, how we get duration. So one way you might think about what's happening at the head of the donkey is that's just the beginning of a stationing behavior and maybe beginning to, to build that behavior. So that's one behavior. And then I think what Gus pointed out and some others is that it's negative reinforcement to introduce the brush because we saw in the beginning of the video that the animal showed a response of trying to escape or avoid the brush. So we get, we, we get the information that the brush is an aversive stimulus to the animal at that stage of the game. But one thing we didn't talk about last time is could perhaps what happens is, is that could it transition to positive reinforcement if that sensation becomes appetitive? So just based on natural history of donkeys is generally, you know, we see that allo grooming where they kind of, you know, you know, chew on each other's uh, um, uh, withers there. So if so, then potentially brushing becomes appetitive once the animal has gotten past the introduction of the brush to the the withers there so we don't we don't know that yet based on you know everything we've seen just in this video clip so potentially the brushing itself you know may become um, a, an appetitive and so maybe using the stationing behavior and using the food to reinforce stationing may not be necessary in the future. Maybe just brushing itself will be reinforcing and so that contrived reinforcer won't even be necessary for this behavior. I imagine there's some of you, like I know, you know, both Ann and Chris work with horses. You know, maybe they have horses that, that just go, oh, brushing, awesome, I can't wait. You know, and maybe they look forward to that behavior or look forward to holding still to get brushed. Um, you know, but in this case, this animal was like that object is the thing that I'm not comfortable with. But by using that negative reinforcement contingency, she was able to introduce the object so that the animal could feel the sensation. And now maybe it's transitioning to where introducing, you know, approaching with a brush becomes um, appetitive. So does that make sense? Um, would that be similar to what in cat is called a switchover? Yes, exactly. Going from going away from an object to going towards it. Yeah, so potentially we don't know. We Maybe in this video we didn't, you know, have enough of that to know that the animal has completely had that, that um, transition. But I think you're right. I think that's what we're, we could be starting to see there. Um, and then we didn't really talk about other contingencies that we might consider in this video, um, like, you know, uh, which I'm sort of jumping ahead here, but maybe like how the behavior of other animals um, impact the behavior of this donkey. Um, you know, the, again, those of you that work with herd animals or even just a pair of animals, you know, one of the things that certainly happens, and maybe I can play the video again. Um, da, 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 video donkey. And well, you certainly saw it Boy, you certainly saw it in um, in in here. Look at the duration on like, that. <laughs> and I should turn That's what we audio. want Roto to do. Um, you know, other animals definitely impact the behavior of of the animals that you're working with, right? When you've got a group of animals, that, you know, there's competition for food. They already have, and this is where that nonlinear contingency analysis is really significant. <clears throat> because, um, you know, they already have previous history with each other, you know, just from living with each other in terms of maybe who gets access to resources more frequently based on, on you know, 
reinforcement and punishment history in terms of interacting with each other. And, um, and how, um, oh, how does this relate to desensitization and counter conditioning? And how did you know I have a slide on that? <laughs> were, you, were you in my house yesterday as I was preparing this? <laughs> that is the perfect question. Yes. So hang on to that. I'm going to come back to that um, as we continue uh, kind of uh, chatting a little bit about um, our nonlinear contingency analysis here. But it's interesting, um, you know, again, when you look at these groups of animals and then you think about all the trainers in here and all the different contingencies that might be going on in this very moment here. <laughs> and Anne says, no, she wasn't in my house. Not as far as I know. <laughs> Not spying on me. All right. Okay, so going going back. <laughs> She's sneaky, says Chris. <laughs> All right. So now um I know we're kinda we're kinda we just touched on, you know, um a little bit of what else might be going on there. <laughs> what was there an, was that an invite to my house? <laughs> okay, so let's go back to the question about um about the counter conditioning versus systematic desensitization because that's a really valid question because a, a lot of people are um, are asking those questions and I it's it's interesting that you asked that because I I saw something on a um, it was like a veterinary group and somebody was struggling with trying to oh they were trying to train injections with a dog and they were really frustrated and I felt really bad for them because they, you know, it sounded like what they were doing was similar to kind of what you see where the person was giving the animal lots of high value food and they were slowly approaching with the syringe and, and what they had now was something that we've discussed before with this group where now the animal was, really more aware that this scary thing was coming and um and now just like well I know what you know what you're trying to do you're trying to sneak you know sneak up on me with this syringe and kind of distract me with food and that's why I think there's so much value in this understanding about contingencies and using what you're seeing here in this video clip as opposed to let me just sneak up on you sneak up on you with this thing and keep you busy with food um, so let's talk a little bit about this, um, this uh, counter conditioning versus looking at contingencies and why I think it was much more successful to look at this for what it really is, which is contingencies and do and, and think about it as contingencies and do what Sonia is doing here and why she was able to be so much, so much more successful here. Um, okay, so let's go to this slide. So if you look at counter conditioning, you have your aversive stimulus, you have your repetitive stimulus, and in reality, they're supposed to be contacted at the same time. And if you go back to our counter conditioning conundrum um, uh, live stream, you're, you're really supposed to not care what the animal is doing, but when we have our deliberate use of contingencies we're really very concerned that the animal is calm and relaxed and we're very, really very deliberate in the way that that aversive stimulus is introduced and so so that immediately takes it out of the realm of counter conditioning and into the realm of shaping so that means that if you know that then you already have this awareness that you're you're using or or you should have this awareness that you're using contingencies and if you do then you can use them really exquisitely like you saw in that video and have really great success the thing to keep in mind about counter conditioning is what it's really relying upon is the extinction of an undesired response in the presence of this aversive stimulus and what appetitives do is they may help with the extinction process, um, but that's not necessarily, you know, this optimal way of getting there, in my opinion. 
I think if we have this awareness, which is what we're trying to do, but with this nonlinear analysis, uh, contingency analysis, if we have this awareness that these contingencies are happening, what we can do is we can arrange conditions so that the animal can emit the de desired response when the aversive stimulus is present. So we just create this environment so that that aversive is basically not, you know, it's just so minimal, you know, the animal is being exposed to it in such a way that it's not very potent, you know, the animal can present the response that you want so that you can reinforce it by removing that stimulus. And so we're basically, as you saw in that video with the donkey, think of that if that was a syringe, like the person who's saying, I can't get this syringe anywhere near the animal. It's, it's just showing such as, you know, it's, I'm trying to keep it busy with this food, but it's too scared of the syringe. So now think of that brush as a syringe instead. You could say, all right, I'm going to deliberately reinforce this animal for stationing or laying down with its chin on my, on my lap. And now I'm going to present that syringe so far away that the animal is like, eh, I, don't, I barely even notice it. And then I'm gonna remove it because it stayed calm. And now I'm gonna present it a little bit closer and it stayed calm, I'm gonna remove it. Instead of keep forcing it closer and closer and trying to get this extinction of a fear response and just using food to kind of help along that extinction response. Instead, what you're doing is you're reinforcing the calm response by removing the aversive stimulus. So having an awareness of that contingency going on, I think you get a better result than forcing the extinction process. I hope that makes sense for you. But again, you know, if you watch our um, counter conditioning conundrum, it goes into that into a lot more detail. So really all we're trying to do here is help people have an awareness that you're really using contingencies. So just have an awareness of it and you'll get better results. It's kind of where we're going. I hope that makes some sense. So let's, let's explore that a little bit further. Um, I'm going to give you another video. This is really along the same lines. Okay, Chris says it makes sense. Let's, let's take that a little further and watch another video. This is very similar. Um, we're going to look at a lion, and um, the goal is to touch its tail, to like move it to um, maybe do blood draws on the tail. So let's watch this and think about what we just talked about here. You ready? Yep. Okay, so I'm going to lower the volume. It's repeating now. And so you're kind of seeing a before and uh, when you see the, the red target stick coming into play, that's a little bit of an after. So, so um, see if you can figure out what we're trying to accomplish there. <laughs> what was going on and you know so so basically I was presented with a problem to address and and then what we did to try and get a little more on track so what do you think's going on there and again using our nonlinear contingency analysis What do you guys think? You are the behavior consultant. You've been asked to help. What would you do? So for well, we can do the easy thing. Do you see do you see the positive reinforcement? I mean, 
mean, it's a little hard to see behind the door and everything, but. <laughs> and and to help you a little bit, there's there's some similarities here. Yep, positive reinforcement for stationing. So there's there's someone at the front end there giving giving a uh, food for that staying in the down position. Okay, um, she wants to remove the hook um, when the line is not moving the tail. Yeah, so same as the donkey, only with other items. Um, yeah, so so what we're, you know, and, and this is where, where, yeah, so we're, and so you guys are right on the thing that it's a negative reinforcement contingency that we're ending up using here because the problem is when this hook is introduced, the lion is letting us know she she doesn't like this, right? She's saying that that touch to me, I don't like. And the way she's letting us know is by twitching her tail. And, um, and so we want to teach her that we want her to leave her tail, we want her tail to, to stay still, right? So how are we gonna teach her that a still tail is what will cause that that hook to be removed right that's that's really what we need to work on here but clearly this the big hook coming in there is quite is, is a condition that's too much right so kind of like with the brush coming close to the donkey if it comes in too close the donkey's going to move away so if the big hook comes in and, and puts some big touching on the body, then we're going to get big twitches. So we have to figure out a way to introduce something in a way that will not get us big twitches. So one of the things this team told me is that she is trained for injections in her hip, and usually she sits quite calmly for that. So what they thought they would try was to you know, touch her hip and generally she doesn't uh, she doesn't do the tail twitches and so they thought maybe with the little target um, stick they could get they could get that and so we didn't have a lot of time and a lot of food so I really only had this one little tiny clip so we just were gonna try it and so they use that little target stick and they just tried touching her hip where they might do that for an injection and basically what they got was less twitching <laughs> as opposed to no twitching and they accepted less twitching and reinforced that by removing the red target stick. Is, does that make sense for y'all there? So, so that was what we accepted in that one training session. Now I'm I'm looking forward to seeing these guys uh, pretty soon in a in a month or so, and so I hope we'll get a chance to visit with them and see if they've made some progress. You know, this was just really introducing the idea to them. And uh, so hopefully they've had a chance to practice because this was uh, quite a while ago when I was there. Um, so hopefully they've been able to practice the idea and, um, and hopefully she's, she's holding, holding that tail more calmly and more still. But I think that's one of the things that, you know, if you, if you don't recognize, you know, that negative reinforcement contingency, you can get really stuck. You know, how do, how do we teach calm you know how do you teach that that animal that keeping that that tail calm when there's an aversive stimulus present when we're just focused on the positive reinforcement contingency okay all right I hope that that makes the um you know maybe this is a good time to to go back to um the, this little slide from last time so remember identifying the negative re it's you know it's easy for us to find the positive reinforcement but remember does with the negative reinforcement does the animal attempt to escape or avoid so we saw with the donkey she moved her body away but they might react in a different way so with this it was you know a big old tail twitch you know the the, the cat didn't get up and walk away but she twitched twitched her tail and, you know, sometimes people think, oh, you know, well, I can use that in a way to, you know, get them to present their tail. But in this case, it wasn't really, you know, something that meant the animal was comfortable. Um, and remember that that aversive stimulus may be an object. It may be a person. It may be another animal. It may be the environment. Remember last time we were asking the porcupine to move into a space it didn't want to be into. Sounds can be aversive stimuli. Smells, touch. 
Um, the stimulus may be introduced to the animal or the animal may be asked to approach the stimulus. And then is the stim if the stimulus is then removed or does the animal move away from the stimulus? So those are all things that can help us, you know, kind of pinpoint if negative reinforcement might be a contingency that's maintaining a behavior we don't want. And that was what was going on with that lion right there. Okay, so let's look at another one. So again, we're going to do a nonlinear contingency analysis here. So remember, there's going to be other contingencies going on here, not just, um, not just one contingency. Uh, do I have video on here? So you're going to kind of see some before and after stuff Great. again. Okay, and so it, it should repeat, and I'm going to explain what they're doing there. So this is a bird that is a part of an um, educational presentation, uh, and so they, are, they want to be able to touch her because they were, were going to be putting um, a telemetry um, mount on her, and so they needed to be able to, um, I forget which, and which type they ended up putting on her, but either way, they would have had to be able to turn it on or off, which usually involves touching a magnet to it. And so they just wanted to be able to touch um, the area where that te telemetry transmitter might be. So that's what they were training her for. So what are some of the contingencies you see? Anybody see any contingencies? What can you see? And we definitely did some brainstorming and changed some things up to make some things work. What do you guys think? All right, well, well there certainly has to be at least the positive reinforcement. Who can see the positive reinforcements? <laughs> or, is, or is my screen frozen? Everyone's too shy to talk today? <laughs> and it's, it's another touch one, you know, so that, that part's easy. But there are, there are more contingencies than one, that's for sure. Everyone's so quiet today. Okay, so we got, so Al's adding in stationing. So positive reinforcement for stationing. <coughs> Anything else? Oh, <laughs> Anne says she's typing. Okay, you get a break. You get a break to you know, to to work on on typing. Okay, like the donkey, positive reinforcement for staying and negative reinforcement for, for staying calm while being touched. Yep. And then, and then we've got um, some others too. Um, negative reinforcement for man on the ground and approaching from behind. Yeah, so, so we, we actually, and you don't see all the steps here, but similar to the brush, um, we did go through that process with these pelicans and and you only there's four pelicans in total and so we did do that process with um the pelicans in general like you saw with the brush so so think of the man as like the brush we did a lot of approaching and retreating for calm for staying stationed basically as we introduced um people for doing the touch behavior 
on all the pelicans. Um, yeah, and pay attention to the primary trainer. Yeah, that gets uh, positively reinforced. So, um, and so what else did you notice in this video that may be using some contingencies that, uh, you know, is a change that you might notice changes in, in the video? That was very intentional. And so it brings in some other contingencies. Uh, yes, any reason why it's done so close to the fence? Yes, absolutely. So there's some positive punishment and negative reinforcement. And I know you all think, oh, no, the, the evil word's positive punishment. But we basically created a shoot, didn't we? Um, yes, yeah, I know you meant done. <laughs> yeah, we basically created a shoot there. And so, you know, inherently within a, you know, when we have barriers like that, um, uh, oh, that's a great question. I'm going to get to your question, Jessica. Um, when, um, when we create a shoot, you know, the, the barriers of the shoot, um, they, you know, animals and humans, we don't want to bump into things necessarily. So, so the walls of the shoot create, they, they, they positively punish and negatively reinforce basically keeping that animal in the center of the shoot. And so those are, are contingencies that are, are occurring as well. And so that's a great question. Um, is withholding food um, negative punish? If, if the animal mugs you, is that negative punishment? Yeah, so negative punishment for that behavior if the animal starts pushing up into you. Ah, yeah, so you decrease that behavior. Yeah, that's a really good um, question. Yeah, um, I, and I think that's a good point to, um, to uh, push, uh, ask that question as well. And, and hang on to that because we're going to look at another video in which I think that we should also ask that question about negative punishment if we see any of that there. So yeah, I do think that can happen um, if an animal starts pushing up against you. You, you may negatively... Um, punish that behavior. Um, and, and we also, although, um, we're looking for quadrants, I guess here as well. Um, sometimes we have extinction in our training sessions as well. Um, but yeah, negative punishment can happen in our training. Se- yeah. Right there, I guess, is when you're, when he pulls his hand away, when the animal starts moving forward. Yeah. Good observations there. Oh, you guys are very good. And Anne says, I noticed that the pelican is adorable. Yeah. All right. Very good, you guys. So you are seeing these nonlinear contingencies. Are the wings up a clue as to their emotional state? Well, I think, I think, you know, all the body language stuff, yeah, does give us information. So I think she's, uh, you know, she's, she's definitely saying something with her wings up there. Um, maybe, um, maybe interested in the, the food items that he has to offer there. And, you know, and they do, like when they walk, they put their wings out. So, um, so that can happen there too. Um, but yeah, those are good questions. So I got another one for you. Um, let's look at this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think she is a little, you know, anticipating the food there in those and, and when they walk, like I said, they put their wings out. So like when we're like when they walk them down to the amphitheater, they tend to put their wings out. Um, so let's look at this. Oh, and Chris was saying that she uses with the hand feeding horses.
turn the audio down. So um, Chris noticed that the flag is a positive reinforcer. Now this is fun. He used play as a reinforcer. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so lots of interesting stuff here, isn't it? Um, so yeah, you guys are noticing that. So he asked her to do certain behaviors and then he's offering the bag on a stick to allow her to play and use this out as a reinforcer. And then what are some other things you notice? He is withholding the flag until she does her behavior. Uses flag as a target. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess he did. I hadn't thought about that. But... Wow. <laughs> wow, I was trying to figure out what was going on. It says Anne, yeah. <laughs> Get excited, then relax. He pointing her to uh, her in the behind with a flag till she gets up. Positive punishment. Um, let's see. Um, oh, I see right there is where you're talking about that. Ah, yeah, it could be. Um, use this flag to ask for calm behavior. Um, let's see. So, but, so what is it about when you mean uses the flag to ask for calm behavior? I would say what is, what happens with the flag? The, the, draw, the draw of the flag is used as a prompt for rolling over. He puts the flag down to get calm behavior. Yeah, yeah. So what does that, I mean, what does that make you think about? That got, see, that got me thinking. It stays while she watches it and he gives the cue. I mean, there's a few things that, get me thinking about it. She relaxes and looks at the flag. I mean, there's a few things that I think about. So if it's, if it's, you know, if it's a re, you know, if it, if it prompts play, put it that way, um, and it's withdrawn, you know, so it gets all that movement and everything. If it's withdrawn, then to me, it sort of negatively punishes <laughs> all that excited play, right? You know, if it's not available, then it's going to decrease play behavior, right? You know, you no longer have it, right? It's gone. Um, and I've also, and if you also look at the two enclosures, one you know, he can stick it in there where she can actually access it and really engage with it. And then the other one has wire over it, so she can't really 
engage with it very much. And so on that side, she doesn't tend to, you know, it's kind of slower for her to engage with it unless it's really in there. You know, then she sort of starts, gets going. Like when it's on the side, she's like, yeah, I can't really get to it. I know I can't. <laughs> Until it comes through, then she's like, okay, well, now maybe I can get to it. Um, so I'm wondering if it acts like a like negative punishment when it's outside. You know, negative punishment for that play behavior. And so that's why she's calmer. And then, and then it uh, is more likely to be, you know, more more play behavior when it's when it's in there and so that's why you see more calm relaxed behavior when it's not in there and then obviously he can use it to reinforce um you know so she does the rollover and then she does so she does the rollover and then he inserts it and she gets to play which she which she likes but then play it immediately kind of stops when he removes it. I don't know. Those are, I don't know. That was my thought. <laughs> but uh, you got it, you know, could I could be wrong. <laughs> it's an interesting one to, to evaluate, right? Of course, she just does that behavior. And then he's trying to positively reinforce it, although she doesn't respond to it as much. She gets a li little bit of a response, just not as big as a, of a response. So maybe it is reinforcing to some extent just a smaller response yeah there's a lot to pick apart on that one isn't there <laughs> a lot to think about on that one well let me go to um to hear then so so back to our identifying contingencies um, so remember for every negative reinforcement contingency there's an accompanying positive reinforcement contingency so when, uh, okay uh, uh, I'll just well we'll read Annetta's comment since it's on the line video it's a brilliant idea using this flag for play the line is a bit overweight so he can train without using food and get some exercise too cue for rollover cat paying attention to flag instead of cue Okay, um, cat, okay, uh, that's true. Trainer moves flag out of sight. Cat does roll over. Um, flag is presented, then using positive punishment is given. Uh, uh, cat does roll over. Flag is presented. Yep, so I'm, he did do that. Um, uh, negative used, then positive punishment is given. Oh, so that might have been at that point where I uh, kind of poked him in the butt a little bit. Um, I think it was trying to get get to a little bit more action on the playing with the flag <laughs> yeah it's so that you know i think what's interesting about that video is there's you know the the thing about behavior right is it's fluid right there's not like it's not like this one moment is just continuing to happen so there's a lot of things to evaluate there it'd be a fun one to go back and keep watching the you know the video over and over again and see if you can see the changing contingencies because i think that's what we're what we've got going on there is just a lot of changing contingencies so so again just you know really interesting to keep you thinking about what's going on there so anyway um so back back to this one here so that um when we look at the pelican again you know, i think the big thing there was the the shoot um gives us the, the um Oh, positive reinforcer is given my bad. Okay, gotcha. I, I see what you're saying. Um, uh, with the shoot on the pelican, that, that's where we've got both the negative and the positive punishment. Um, and, uh, and also the negative reinforcement of the guy moving in and out um, eventually gets us to the point where we can touch. Um, and therefore, moving away from or approaching, um, moving towards the stimulus may be decreased depending on the procedure and behaviors addressed. And, and that's why I said, remember, the stimuli such as shoots, walls, hot wire, other animals can serve as punishers for behavior. Again, thinking about our herd dynamics with um, the donkeys as well. And, uh, and then talking about negative punishment, throughout a session, there may be moments where appetitives may be removed. And this can be include what you are delivering to reinforce behavior, but also the things associated with reinforcement, the props, the trainer, 
access to desired spaces, animal companions. These conditioned reinforcers can impact behavior when we remove them and also the unconditioned reinforcers. Um, the, these can be more challenging when the animal is aware of what we have to offer. We remove it and the animal is aware it is still potentially available. Um, and also establishing operations. So if the animal might be really hungry or something, um, degrees of freedom. So this is that stuff that um, Sean, Will, and Masanishi Muta are going to talk to us about in goats. So like if the animal can't get access to that someplace else. Um, and what is um, offered if it's a critical consequences, uh, consequence can also impact responses. So if the animal really needs that to survive and can't get in any other way, that can make an animal really eager to have what you have to offer. And that can um, really impact how big of a deal it is when that thing is removed. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. I think that's going to, oh, I don't know, bring us to a recap here, which, you know, I have the same recap points as last time, um, just because, you know, we're kind of doing a, um, a part two here. But nonlinear contingency analysis will help you see all the learning processes impacting the target behavior. And again, you know, I think this is really helpful for us, especially when I think about, you know, like introducing these objects that are helpful for us in, uh, you know, especially with medical care, things like that. You know, so because I, I, you know, and again, this for me has been a process too. Um, you know, I see a lot of people really struggling with like, you know, I've got this animal, it's afraid of this thing. How am I going to help them overcome their fear response? And they're getting a little bit stuck. And I'm finding, especially with these, you know, recognizing that we've got this um, negative reinforcement contingency going on, you know, if we really see it as a contingency instead of trying to have this animal cope by just saying, well, let me keep you busy with some food, I think we're, we're going to get a lot farther. Um, so uh, again, positive reinforcement is usually easy for most of us to see, um, but hopefully you got a few tips to help you identify the other learning processes. And um, and again, this helps us get away from the labels of good and bad. It's just helping us understand a little bit better what's going on. And again, remember that these are just laws of nature and how they're used in a procedure is it, it can vary tremendously. So what we're really trying to remember to do is, you know, do your risk benefit analysis to determine what procedure will be most effective, efficient, and optimal. And what I mean by optimal is you're going to maximize benefits and minimize harm. So that's the really important thing. Um, Anna, Anna, Anne says she appreciates the brainstorm. Yeah, it's one of those things that's ongoing and, you know, you get better at it with practice. I'm not perfect by any means. I still, I still got to practice. Um, which reminds me, I'm so excited about this conference coming up in July, the Constructional Approach to Animal Welfare and Training, because I've put together a presentation that's all about um, using the constructional approach, which really focuses on this nonlinear contingency analysis and about how to apply it with herds. Do, do, do. <laughs> um, and um, especially with wild caught herds of antelope, which I had to, uh, an opportunity to work with quite a bit, and other hoofstock as well. And so this presentation, um, I'm, I'm really pleased with how it came out. And it's um, also being translated into Japanese by Masa. Uh, and there's other speakers like Joe Lang and Jesus Rosales Ruiz and Sean and Masa. And the way it's going to work is each evening there'll be an the hour and a half presentation, and then which you kind of you know watch at your own pace, and then we have Q and A afterwards and panel discussions. So it's it's really cool. And my presentation is very 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 detailed on how to apply this with herd dynamics and. And, uh, and really taking you through the steps of how I've made this work for me and working with these animals that are like, they're like on the other side of the enclosure. There's no freaking way they want to come over to you and take food. Um, it's just not in their repertoire yet. So, so how do you get started with them and how do you make progress? And so I hope you'll join us for that. Um, and then the next goats is on the calendar with Hillary Hankey from Avian Behavior International, and it's called How Wonderful. I was wrong. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and so, again, if you um, are a member of AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com, you get to attend that live for free, and then you can also watch the replay for, for, for free. We do have an option for folks that are not members um, at, that you can just watch that presentation as well. Uh, and you can go to ATF Goats for more information on that. The best deal is to become a member because then you get just access to everything. Uh, <clears throat> and um, 
And I know if you're you're willing to stick around for um, a little legal update, I know that's a lot of words there, but I I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read if you don't mind. Um, <clears throat> I actually have to go to a hearing today, but uh, where we're at is the the plaintiffs have filed an amended claim which kind of delayed our actual hearing on the motion to dismiss. But um, in addition to the approximately two minutes and 24 seconds, plaintiffs have selected from the 82 minute audiovisual works in question in which they allege are defamatory. The amended claim names my GoFundMe campaign and my post updating my supporters as additional defamation. Place, plaintiffs also seek an adjunction, injunction against statements they consider to be defamatory in the future. On March 8th, uh, 2022, my legal team filed an amended motion to dismiss and an affidavit in support of the motion to dismiss with supporting exhibits. The following are some excerpts from the motion. Plaintiff and defendant, and defendant have engaged publicly in the scholarly debate in several ways over decades as discussed in detail. Uh, this is not, as plaintiff's amended complaint states, a smear campaign by a disgruntled formal employee against her former employee, but rather a long-standing and continuing debate among many leaders of the animal training industry about best practices for achieving desired training results while enhancing animal welfare. Defendant has frequently challenged plaintiffs for their weight management practices and beliefs as training and compliance tools. In response, plaintiffs have taken steps to undermine defendant's credibility in the industry to squelch her opportunities to be heard and have ultimately filed this lawsuit, which in addition to having no merit is an attempt to silence defendant from further speaking publicly against plaintiff's reliance on weight management as a training and compliance tool. Here's an excerpt from our motion regarding plaintiff's allegations about uh, that go, my GoFundMe posts are update and updates are defamatory. Plaintiffs' new allegations are incomplete, and when viewed in their full context, they are expressions of pure opinion and or they are subject to absolute protection of the litigation privilege and are incapable of defamatory meaning and cannot be defamatory per se. And here is an excerpt from our response regarding an injunction against statements they consider to be defamatory in the future. Plaintiffs seek an injunction against defamatory statements in the future. What they request is unconstitutional. An injunction in this case would be would also violate First Amendment principles. De temporary injunction directed to speech is a classic example of prior restraint on speech tr triggering First Amendment concerns. An injunction may not be directed to prevent defamatory speech. Uh, prior restraints on speech and publication are the most serious and least, intoler least tolerable infringement on First Amendment rights. Uh, the filed documents that um, contain much more detail, and I encourage you to read them to get a more complete understanding of the depth of our response, and you can read the amended motion to dismiss on my website and also the associated affidavit and exhibit here are, are on my website. Um, and again, you all have been incredibly wonderful about being supportive and positive with your comments, and it, as evidenced by the amended claim, this has been extremely important. I appreciate so very much that we have created a strong, supportive community and have refrained from posting negative comments about the plaintiffs as I have requested from the beginning. Please continue to do so. We can show support. We can continue to show support without discussing the plaintiffs. Let's focus on winning this legal battle based on its merits. And my legal team is just so fantastic. They've worked many, many, many hours collecting information and preparing these documents, as have I. Um, so I very much appreciate the support. Um, unfortunately, my legal fees far exceed what I've been able to raise to date. So even sharing this information helps so much. And um, I continue to really appreciate your support. So um, I, will, I will stop um, talking about that. And um, if you are inclined to become a member of AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com, that also helps tremendously. And we will um, focus on... Uh, winning on the merits and uh and thank you so much for your words of support they mean a whole heck of a lot all right guys i hope you've enjoyed these live streams um i really enjoyed doing them with you there it's been an incredible um few years of learning new stuff and that's that's the coolest stuff is being able to learn with you and share with you and i just listened to a really cool well, I listen to journal articles. I, I put them on um, my PDF reader and I let my PDF reader out loud to me or read out loud to me because uh, then I can, you know, kind of do other things while I'm learning. And um, a really cool thing is, uh, is, is, you know, talking about these topics with you all, even though I wish, I wish we, you didn't have to type to me. I wish you could talk back to me, but you can in the tower talks um, for those of you that are members. And, uh, 
you know, there's, there's value in that. You know, that's one of the things that I was learning in this article today. There's, there's a lot of value in talking about these topics out loud and learning together out loud. So, um, so, you know, this, doing all this together with you all has been, been great growth for, for, um, for me personally, and I, I hope it's been good for you as well. So I appreciate you all being here. Uh, let's see, and I see I see a few more comments that I missed here. That was that was really cool. So someone wants a number a number uh, three <laughs> on this topic. We might have to I might have to do a course or something maybe. Um, although I, I there's some people who are, are more professional on this, who, you know, more experienced on this that have been doing that. Uh, and someone says, it seems like all four quadrants are at play more than we are often aware of or in control over. Yeah, I think, I think that's really kind of the, the gist of, you know, what we're learning, or at least what I'm learning now. And maybe, and maybe, oh, thanks, so. <laughs> Al. And maybe what you guys are, are finding out, finding too in this process is that, uh, you know, having this awareness is really enlightening. I mean, I think that's that's what I've kind of learned on this journey. I, you know, I, I would say since, um, the, for me, the turning point was the Art and Science of Animal Training Conference in the last one that we had um, in person. Um, I, I really had like a going from black and white to color moment as I describe it. And I did that in a presentation um, I talked about it in a presentation I did where I felt like uh, I just had a, an aha moment, but it, it, but it, you know, like as um, was it Robert Epstein? Epstein, I always say those last names wrong. Um, that behavior analyst puts it, you know, in when he talks about generativity. We talked about this in, you know, being creative, um, which was, you know, big a big uh, platform for him. He talked about when you contact all these different stimuli in your life that. You know, that's one of the ways that you, you know, start having these, they seem like aha moments, but they're probably not as accidental as they, they appear to be. Um, but it was really contacting those people there and in hearing all the different things that they were saying when it finally put all these pieces together for me where I went, oh, oh things are not as they appear. And it sent me down a new path in, um, in my learning that I think has been really phenomenal and, and helped me see that there is so much more than what I've been taught in my past. And so I'm really grateful for those people and having contacted those people. And, um, and hopefully it, it, you know, it's an opportunity for me to share that with you and, um, and help you see as well what I've learned from those people that there's, there's more to what, what we know in animal training and hopefully we'll continue to, uh, grow from this and be able to help animals even more just because there's there's information that we haven't been exposed to yet that, that's going to help us do this even better so we'll continue to help animals by learning about this nonlinear contingency analysis right so so cool so look at all your kind words uh strength and power and awesome and we learn so much from you and we are addicted to getting so clever and so true so you guys are awesome um uh, just when you think you've got things figured out, you don't exactly, but you know, how wonderful, you know, how wonderful, you know, like Hillary says in her presentation, how wonderful I was wrong. So now we get to learn even more and I, you know, how cool is that? We don't, we don't get to just sit back and go, I know everything now. And now I'm just gonna, you know, watch trash TV or something. I don't know about you guys, but every day I'm like, I'm like listening to new material that teaches me new things. And, you know, and even this unpleasant situation that I'm in is, sent me in directions where I'm learning new information that, um, that, you know, I get to pass on to you. So, um, so, you know, we're, we're making good things, we're making good things out of, out of difficult situations. So there we go. All right, guys. Well, with that, I am going to get ready for, uh, you know, going to a hearing today. Woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, I appreciate you all so very, very much and, um, and more than you possibly could know. And I'm looking forward to meeting with you again next, next week, I think. Yeah, I get to see you next week. So, um, and I've already got ideas for what we can talk about next week, um, but I won't share them just yet. <laughs> okay. I appreciate you all for being here and, um, and we'll talk again soon. All right. Take care. You all have a great week and, um, and that's, that's going to do it for this time. All right. Bye, everybody.